Bible with you. This is not the Beatles song, but the subject for tonight's Wednesday night class is help. And we're looking in Luke's gospel tonight, chapter 10. Some real wonderful scripture there. Um, of course, your line is, we'll be the judge of that. But Luke's gospel, chapter 10. We're going to pick up the reading in verse 40. And uh, then we'll just read to the end of the chapter. And uh, think a bit about this little exchange and interaction between uh, these two sisters and the Lord. Uh, Luke's gospel again. Uh, Dr. Luke was obviously a um, physician and he was a Gentile. Um, my Greek mentor tells me his Greek is, this man's Greek was excellent. And he does give a lot of uh, attention to medical details and the healing accounts he records. Traveled with Paul, as most of us remember. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. I just got a fresh testimony, hot off the griddle, so I think I'll just use that as my opening illustration. We're talking tonight, of course, about help where to find it, how to find it, how to get it. I was uh, just getting more information on my, this procedure that I'm supposed to have, and finally the nurse got back to me, and that's another answered prayer. I mentioned this, I think, a week or two ago. I couldn't seem to get through the red tape, and Bill texted me, and it was, he, he said what he had prayed or, or con uh, affirmed. It was a prophetic pronouncement that the red tape was cut, and I'd be on the fast track within 24 hours of him texting me that. What do you think happened? Nurse gets on the phone, tells me what's what. So I'm waiting for her to give me the additional information about the exact date, which I got yesterday, and then blood work in advance and all that. So I thought, well, I've got all my ducks in a row. But as I, it was good news, but on the other hand, it was bad news because I got to get this procedure, you know, even though it's at the end of the month next month. So I, I went to sleep praying, of course, and I said, Lord, thanks for everything you've done, but I would really appreciate any other encouragement you would have for me. And I said, whatever it is, however you want to send it, vision, dream, scripture, someone calling me, text, whatever. I said, just I'm looking to you to give me additional help and encouragement. I don't know about you, but I'm a wimp regarding all things medical, always have been. And God, I was telling Bill, God treats me just with kid gloves. He always gives me something extra. So I went to sleep. Now, bear in mind, my, my doctor's name is Kong, Dr. James Kong. Been at it for 15 or 20 years. Very nice young fellow. So I generally get up at least once per night, generally once. So just before I got up in the middle of the night, I have this dream. And in the dream, I'm standing beside my second martial arts teacher. My first martial art was uh, Shidoru, and that was between eighth grade and um, freshman year in high school back in Pittsburgh, three months. The second martial art I studied was Taekwondo and Hapkido, and Solomon and I studied that together back when I was a young man. So here's our instructor standing beside me, and he's, he's showing me through this large banquet place. I don't know whether it was a house or a restaurant, and he's chatting people up, you know, and I'm just kind of walking with him. And I can tell I'm telling him about what's going on in my life because he asked me what's, what's, what's new. I haven't seen him in years. So I told him I have had a health challenge and I'm going to have a procedure and whatnot. And it looked like he didn't particularly care, which is not really like him in real life. It was like, you know, don't bore me with your problems. But we're just walking along. And pretty soon he says, come here. So he leads me out of this banquet area across the way, and apparently he had his dojo in a separate building adjacent to his house. So he says, follow me. So naturally, I'm following him. So he goes first, walks in, he says, stand right there. And he gets in front of me. He said, do whatever I tell you. I'm going to, in other words, I'm going to fix your problem. So he was listening, he was paying attention, 
it just seemed like he wasn't. And he starts making different martial art moves. And I woke up with a start. I didn't have to think longer than two seconds to realize what that was. Do you know what my, my martial arts teacher, his, his name was? Hong Kong Kim. Do whatever I tell you, I'm gonna fix you. I told Bill, I woke up from that and I cried like a baby. I don't know when I've cried such tears of joy that God would be that meticulous and speak to me a word of confirmation in a way that I could not possibly misunderstand. I think my instructor is still living. He'd be in his mid-80s probably. I have a, I have a mind to call him. But this is an example of what we're looking at tonight, working in real life. This is not a, a story. This is not something that we have to convince ourselves. Well, maybe God will help us, you know, if it's a clear day with no wind blowing. It's, it's, it's much more than that. We, all we need is Celestial 911 on our speed dial, and he will take care of things. We'll look at that with you tonight. I've divided this into two sections. First of all, the setting of this, and then the saying, what this girl said, and what it means for you, for me, for believers today. Uh, the setting is the house that was apparently owned by Martha. She was the mistress of the house. We see that in verse 38. And the scripture says she received Jesus into her home. Now, we don't have a middle voice in English. I've mentioned this. We have active voice, I hit him. Uh, passive voice, my car was wrecked, but we don't have any middle voice. Middle voice in the Greek language, among other things, generally means you're participating in what happens. You didn't exactly cause it, it didn't happen to you, but you're, you're intelligently uh, getting involved with it, usually with a view to your own benefit. So it's like, if you get the picture, Martha had this attitude, uh, attitude hey, this guy's got something going. This guy's got something going on. I want to know him better. Now, you might remember that uh, Martha, Mary, and their brother Lazarus are the only people beside John that wrote the gospel that Jesus is specifically, specifically stated to have loved. He loved Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. And we know that John was the disciple Jesus loved. Another little thing that I found out, which I found very encouraging, very faith-building, Dr. Robertson says that in the city of Bethany, there still exists a tomb with an inscription, Martha, Mary, and Eleazar. Eleazar is the Hebrew name. We bring it into Greek, and it's Lazarus. So isn't that interesting? Uh, is it the same people? We don't know. could very well be, but it's the same city. In any case, these were real persons. Now, Martha had the sister, of course, named uh, Maria or Mariam, depending. Uh, and the, the Bible says here, if you read the surrounding verses, who also sat at Jesus' feet, listening to his word. So you're getting the picture. Be like you tonight. And I talk about Mike came to Wednesday night class. Charlie also sitting across from him. So they're both there. Get that picture. This is kind of important regarding what happens. They both started out where they belong at the feet of Jesus. Only one remained there. Now watch this. But Martha is being distracted concerning much serving. The word serving there is where we get our word deacon from. Did you know that not only are deacons assistants to the pastor of a local fellowship, did you know that our, uh, our political leaders are called ministers by Paul? Same word. They minister for us. We don't always see it that way, do do we? We don't think of them as giving something positive. A lot of times, depending on the politician, they might be taking from us more than they're giving. But in any case, in a perfect world, it's, it's the same word used for spiritual uh, service to somebody. And so she's distracted concerning much serving. In her case, it wasn't politics. It wasn't the word of God. It was food, preparing the meal. Uh, you may remember, uh, this predates that, but in the early church, when the service got together, it was very simple. They would sing a hymn or two, and then they would, um, somebody would give a, a message from, from the word, whatever the reading was that day. Then they would pray one for another, pray for the sick, take an offering for the poor or the, the ministry, and then they'd finish with a meal. 
So it was possibly this very idea that Martha was getting ready a meal to thank the teacher for ministering there. In any case, um, this was a development that Martha allowed to happen. It says she was distracted. She allowed herself to be distracted. She allowed circumstances to control her. My mentor tells the story about a farmer who was really earnestly seeking to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. And he would pray and pray, but never kind of really receive it. So another time he's praying, fasting, skipped his lunch. He's on his hands and knees praying earnestly, Lord, baptize me in the Holy Ghost. And once again, the, the devil speaks to him. Now, when a cow gets up, does it get up on its front legs first or its rear legs? So the farmer stops praying. Well, I declare I better go find out. So he leaves the prayer room, goes out into the field, look at his cows, see whether they get up on the back legs or the front legs. What happened to him praying to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost? He got distracted. He let, it, he let a thought distract him. And that's what happened with, with uh, Martha. I learned this, which I find very interesting. This word distracted translates a word that means to draw around, to draw around. Dr. Robertson says that it actually is an expression related to anxiety, but the picture is there's so much anxiety, the person's countenance gets twisted. And he talks about men and women whose faces have actually become twisted because they're always worrying. This word begins, this Greek word begins with peri, which means around, periospato, to be distracted. So it left a permanent mark, not only on the mind, but on, on Martha's looks, perhaps. So there's the setting. Let's look at the saying now. And bursting in, she said, Lord, is it not a concern to you that my sister Mary left me alone to serve? How could she be bursting in if she was sitting with Mary at Jesus' feet, which it said she was? She must have left. Now, isn't this interesting? Is it of no concern to you, Lord, that my sister left me to serve? In actual fact, Mary didn't leave anyone. Martha's the one that left. Martha got out of Dodge. They were both listening. They were both studying with the master. And Martha, for whatever reason, allowed her to be herself to be distracted, got up, left, went into the other room, and got so aggravated that she came in and basically got her sister told, and she wanted to do it through the Lord. This is the perfect picture of people that you and I know, perhaps ourselves even, who act out. You ever know anybody like that? They will burst out into a complaint or an argument or uh, use the expletive language. Uh, in any case, it's like the straw that breaks the camel's back and they just uh, seemingly burst out with something for no reason. There's a reason. Why that happens is they're not keeping short accounts with God. In other words, they're carrying around a lot of stuff in here that shouldn't be in here, that should be just left with the Lord. Peter goes so far as to say, cast or throw all your anxieties on the Lord. The picture there is a donkey or a horse that you would toss a blanket on before you saddle the animal. Just toss your cares. I don't know if you remember, I, I meant, mentioned many years ago, Dr. Peel had an example that he would give his congregants who came to him with worry issues. He said, just imagine at night that you've got a bag beside your bed and call it the worry bag. And before you go to sleep, toss everything that's bothering you into that bag. You're not ignoring your worry. You're not pretending it's not there. You're looking at it, but you're not clutching it. You're letting it go. He said, just keep on tossing whatever's bothering you into that worry bag for the Lord to take care of. Most of his congregants said, there's only one problem with that. I never get to the last worry. I fall asleep. That's not a bad thing, is it? Does Pastor Joe like sleep? Well, 
talk to somebody who knows him. So think about this. Martha actually left Mary. They both started out at Jesus' feet. One left. Having sat down at the feet of Jesus, the scripture says, listening to his teaching. Now, here's where you and I, I think, can get a little help. When you and I are out of place, when we are not standing where God set us, when we're not bringing forth fruit where he planted us, and something goes south, it's normal for us to look outward for someone out there to blame for our predicament. You've never done that, I'm sure. Some people do. Some of them are even believers. Hard to accept, isn't it? Since we're all saved, sanctified, satisfied, and petrified. But anyway, I'll never forget years and years ago, a very, capital V, circled, highlighted, and underlined, a very well-known lady minister gave a confession in the midst of her teaching. She was talking about something along this line and that she had lived at least three decades of her marriage doing this, acting out, uh, shouting, basic, but it was basically pointed in one direction. Anybody know where? Her husband confessed this on national television. She wasn't aware of doing it. She would explode. But isn't it unfair and hurtful to force other people into the role of scapegoat or whipping boy? But this woman minister said finally she saw what she had been doing. And she said all she can do now is try to live differently. And thank God every day she had the kind of husband she had who didn't get out of Dodge. And that, of course, works the other way. Some women are suffering in silence because they married an idiot. And, and the idiot, of course, doesn't even know what's going on. He thinks he's just living his life when in actual fact he's like a bull in a china closet. And he's causing everybody around him trouble. Whether he knows it or not, they do. And this is what happened with, Mary, with Martha. She, she got herself into a jam, and instead of looking up and reaching up, she re reached out and used Mary or tried to as a whipping boy or a scapegoat. So instead of adjusting her behavior, she lashed out at Mary indirectly through the Lord. Therefore, speak to her at once in order that she may help. Now, this is really something. I find that this is the ideal way to say, stay stuck in life problems. To keep asking God to tell somebody else what to do about your situation. Forgive the personal reference, but when I, when I considered this, another procedure, which I already had once, didn't work, when I thought about all that again, I could have gone hither, thither, and yon, telling people what happened, why it didn't work, and belly aching and whinging and whining. Or I could deal direct, eliminate the middleman and deal direct. Lord, here's what's going on. I don't like it. I don't care for this. I wish I didn't have to do this. And you know what? If there's any other encouragement you can give me, I sure would like to have it. Now, can God use a person to bring that to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. He can give you, as he did in my case, a dream that will communicate encouragement or whatever you're looking for. You, he can lead you to read a book. You can turn the television on and it's on a Christian station. Believe it or not, you can sometimes get something good there. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't watch much Christian TV. It lowers the tone of mine. But occasionally you can, you can learn something that will help you. But the idea is where you're looking and it should be up. That's where you and I should look so we don't have to stay stuck in life problems, focusing the, on other people rather than looking for help for ourselves. Just the other day, I'm making a left turn. I got the green arrow for the left turn, right? So I'm pulling out to make that left turn. The oncoming traffic, the side lane there is supposed to stop during that green light for the red turn, yeah? So I'm going, here comes the car in that lane starting out. So I didn't know whether we, gonna, we were going to play this for a while. You know, you go two feet, then I'll go two feet. I just stopped, and I just let him go. And then I just kept going left. Guess what? That whole thing took probably five to ten seconds, that whole little interaction. 
Brother Joe was still dealing with it, tooling down the highway. Why would he do that? What's wrong with that jerk? Doesn't he know the green left turn signal gets priority? He's supposed to stop there. What would make him do that? Then I brought God into it. God, what's wrong with some of these people? Don't they pay attention? Wow. As I, about, the t- about the time I got to the last turn close to the church, I was asking myself, what's wrong with you? What's bothering you? And I realized I had some unfinished business. I had allowed myself to be distracted. And I thought, this will never do. And I, that's when I really began to pray again and realized what was bothering me, gave it to the Lord, and the Lord knew what to do with it. Isn't that beautiful? So Martha's problem and ours was not seeking, or not seeing, I should say, the real problem. She thought the problem was Mary. She thought the solution was getting Mary told through the teacher. The real problem was who? Martha. The real problem is usually you or me. And if we take care of us, the other people will take care of themselves. Now, I want to mention something about this word. Bid her, therefore, at once that she help me. This word only appears here and one other place in the entire New Testament, and that's Romans 8.26. Bid her that she help me. The word is sin with Andi, against, and lamvano, I take or I receive. So Martha was saying, tell Mary to take hold together with me against this need of food, basically. Now, it's amazing. It's a slightly different tense, but it's the same verb in Romans 8.26. Likewise, through groaning, likewise, the Holy Spirit helps Our weaknesses, us, the neas. It can be sicknesses. 90 times out of 100 in the New Testament, that word means sickness, physical sickness. Our weaknesses, whether it's physical, mental, emotional. The Holy Spirit takes hold together with us against whatever the problem is. Isn't that good news? It's it's a synergy. We're working with the Holy Spirit. How's that work? We're doing the speaking. The Holy Spirit's giving us the words. We don't... their sighs and cries for deliverance that are unable to be spoken in our language. So the Holy Spirit has to give us the language. Same word, only twice in the New Testament. Isn't that a beautiful picture? To ask God to take hold together with you against your problem. Lord, here's my problem. I don't like medical procedures. I already had this one. It was only half done. Why do I have to go through this again? I don't want to do this. It, Lord, you, do I got the right place? Do I got the right doctor? Do I got the right this? And that might not be you. I'm talking about myself. And I asked basically the Lord to help me. Not the Beatles song. Help me. And he did. And he will for you. He will for any believer if we just get this right and learn from, from Martha's experience. Jesus knew what was wrong, but Martha didn't. Listen to his response. Very concise, very clear. But answering, Jesus said to her, Martha, Martha, you backslidden buzzard, get out of my sight. No, isn't he kind? Isn't he something? He's not like us. Martha, Martha, you are being anxious and troubling yourself concerning many things. That is an insightful diagnosis of the real problem. That lady minister shared in that same message how she was abused as a child. Horrible male authority figures all her life. She didn't go into great detail, but she said enough that you knew she had been around the bend and then some. But she didn't realize she was putting other men, particularly her husband, in the place of the ones that had abused her. So she was using someone in the present as a whipping boy, as a stumbling block, as a scapegoat, to somehow get back at the people that caused the problem. Neither one of those things would heal her. She realized getting even or punishing someone else for what someone did, none of that would heal the real problem. The real problem wasn't a need to strike out at someone else, but to help 
herself. I was talking to Jan Sunday about a martial art that we studied. Solomon and I taught her. Her husband taught us. Um, and, and the whole the whole theory behind that particular martial art is you you try to avoid the problem. The idea is to have your opponent get so frustrated that he quits trying to do something because you have learned a way to use that person's power against them. So they keep getting getting sidelined. They don't they don't get to do what they want to do. The the goal theoretically would wake up, smell the coffee, stop trying to do this, and you know, keep yourself from getting hurt and don't hurt anyone else. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. And do you notice, according to Jesus, this worry, this troubling of herself didn't happen to her? Didn't happen to her. Martha, Martha, you are anxious. Active voice. You are anxious. You're worrying, right? You're doing this. It's not happening to you. You're doing this. And you are troubling yourself. So it didn't happen to her. The first ver ver uh, verb is active. You're anxious. So here's the person at night uh, going over his problems like you'd finger the beads on a rosary or something, one by one, rehearsing it, going over it again, all different angles, rather than dropping it in the, the bag we mentioned or throwing it on the back of the Lord. Uh, the second word is in the middle voice and troubling yourself concerning many things. There's that middle voice again. Martha, according to Jesus, somehow saw a perceived benefit in troubling herself about whether the, the meat is burned or whether it's too rare or uh, whether the coffee's hot or whatever. She was doing this to herself, thinking this is much more important than what I was doing with Mary before I started the meal, sitting at the teacher's feet, listening to his word. This is much more important. She had the idea that this, this was the... This was the real deal. We, have we ever been there? I think we all have. We're convinced whatever we're worrying about is more important than talking to God. Oh, I'll be all right until someone pulls out on me when they're not supposed to, and then I'll get them told through Christ all the way to the office, and then sit down and read the Bible. Praise the Lord. I'm in the ministry. <laughs> yeah, none of you ever have that problem. I, I know. Right before we let Martha go, I, I want to just look at these two words because I think it'll help you. It sure helps me. Anxious and troubling. This first word, anxious, translates merimnas. It's from merizo. What's merizo mean, Pastor? It means to separate or a lot, to cut something up. It's used in the Greek Old Testament of Joshua dividing the land for the tribes. In other words, Judah gets this portion of the land, Issachar gets this portion of the land. It's the same word. So what it's saying is Martha had a divided mind. She was going six ways from Sunday in her mind regarding this. this. Is there enough wine? Is there the, the other? Is it too much? Too many plates? How many plates? How many forks? Et cetera, et cetera. And she was working herself up into a frenzy. The second word is used again only here in the entire New Testament. It translates tirvazi, which means to disturb, to disturb. If you think of calm water, you put your finger in there and give it this. And sadly, she was doing this to herself. Have you ever done that? Oh, my gosh. What a, what a difficult habit to break. Uh, thank God. I'm a slow study, but I eventually get it. I'm getting better at this. I'm getting better at this. I'll think of something unpleasant. And the fight or flight response kicks in, right? We have no control over that. It kicks in. Pretty soon, I'm coming up with six or seven alternatives in my mind to this problem that hasn't happened yet. That's when the fun begins. And, but I'm getting better. I'm getting better at it. I'm, I'm, I've learned to stop. I just stop. Wait a minute. And then I just change from being involved in it to just observing it like a cloud in the sky. I, I remind myself, I'm not my thoughts. I have thoughts. That weird feeling, I'm not my feelings. I have feelings. And I just step back and observe. And then I talk to the Lord about it. I suggest you try that if you haven't. So coming in for a landing, Jesus then diagnosed the real problem. But of one thing there is need. And Maria or Miriam 
chose the good portion, which shall not be taken from her. And if you study that out, that phrase, good portion, it's, it's a f- kind of a play on words there. He was, he's very clever, Jesus, isn't he? It, it's a food word. She's chosen the best morsel. In, in Bible days, that would be the best meal in the buffet. You know, there's ever how many different kinds of meat or uh, whatever, different kinds of wine, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a, a particular steak that's especially fine, grade A or beyond. That's the one everybody would want to have. Usually save that for the host or the guest, the big, big shot guest. And Jesus called sitting at his feet and listening to his word the choice bit of food rather than what Martha was worrying about and taking care of and preparing. So once again, it's basically just reminding us to put God first and then other things will fall into place. It'll keep us from staying stuck in a life situation that we don't have any answer for, which many times does, go, like the lady preacher, it goes back to the past, to the way she was raised or abused and so on. It, it lets us see what's really going on, where we're really at, what the real problem is. And, and I think secondly, it gives us a real solution, a person to ask to help, rather than Martha asking Mary to help. Martha should have been asking the Lord to help because most of the time people round about us don't have shoulders strong enough to carry the burden that we're trying to give them. But the Lord does. The Lord does. Anybody have any input on this tonight? Does help anybody? Yeah, Bill. Uh, that's a perfect coming That's a wrap that you just did. <laughs> But what I was going to say is, you know, and you know that that's the truth, and that's what works. But how, is there a way, any way, for the son who can motivate somebody else to see the wisdom of what we're doing? Because, <laughs> you, know, you know, it's so easy to see it somebody else. I and mean, they all these fingers point back at me, you know, so I got my problems too. But, uh, but if, if you just get them to understand, and that's frustrating. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, uh, one way that I think to do is to do what you, what you do at AA. One way to do it is to tell people, here's how I, this is what was wrong with me. Here's how I beat that thing. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so successful after all these years. Experience, right. And you're not telling them what to do. You're just telling them what worked for you. And that's what Jesus did. He just told her what's what. You mentioned that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, right. and John. Uh-huh. I suddenly found myself wondering which love. Oh, yeah. So I looked it up, and okay. for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, it says agapo, agape. Yeah. And the disciple who Jesus loved is Philea. Wow. Brotherly love. Wow. But um, the other thing is, I, um, I had a laugh when we started because I was looking at the definitions of, um, let me see, cumbered, about, and much. Yes. And it's nearly hysterical if you put the three words together. Oh. Uh, this is, uh, who's it, who would this be? Strong's. Okay. Strong's King yeah, Sure. sure. Um, cumbered says to drag all around, to distract. Yeah. Okay, then about is an additional word, and that is um, through, around, uh, it sounds, it, it, it includes excess or completeness, completeness, you know, right, sure. a whole lot, dragged around sure. a whole lot, and yeah. then they add much. Oh, wow. <laughs> After that, which you know is pulling. Yeah. So she was really yeah. going. Yeah. yeah. And that, that, you can see that's where the outburst came from. The thing about it is she had done it to herself. We're not being critical of her. We do the same thing. But the good news is we don't have to keep doing it. <laughs> we, can, we can learn. It took the lady preacher 30 years to figure out it was her childhood, not her husband. You know? And that's the same thing with men and women, whatever. Um, a lot of times the problem is not what we think it is. It's just like in Martha's case, but sometimes you can get around someone wise and they will enlighten you, right? 
if you've got an understanding heart, open heart, someone touches the truth, it'll change your life. But otherwise, you can just suffer. It's like, yeah, there's something wrong with you. Quick, give me a hammer so I can hit my head. <laughs> it feels so good when I stop. Yeah. Good. And, uh, like, when, uh, when people, with the example of the worry bag, when people yeah. like, kind of put things into yeah. it, uh, what, how do we guarantee God's taking the worry bag? Can we, yeah, right. You know, we're not just assuming that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I think, once again, in Scripture, like, that's why I mentioned Peter casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And the, the words there mean affectionately, peculiarly. In other words, it's as though you're the only one. That's why we cast our care on him, because he, he cares for us individually, just like we're the only one with a room. So that, that's just, again, like anything else, believe what the Bible says, believe the words. Um, and then... I personally think that a lot of that is the use of the imagination, picturing that, because your body can't tell the difference between a real experience and an imagined one. The proof of that is a dream. You, know, you, you have a horrifying dream, you wake up, but the doctor's there, they'll tell you what your pulse is, your blood pressure through the roof, your respiration quick. Uh, it's not real, is it? It was, it was just a figment of your imagination, but it seemed real. That can work in the positive. You picture something pleasant, and it has the opposite effect on you. I'm sure you guys have probably heard about that. Really, years and years ago now, they did an experiment with uh, baseball, uh, baseball, basketball players. For, I think it was 21 days. They had these basketball players, one third of the group practicing free throws, right? The second group, not practicing. The third group, not practicing, but imagining they were making perfect free throws. At the end of the three weeks, the ones who had practiced increased in their ability 23%. The ones who didn't practice or do anything had no improvement. The ones who didn't practice but imagined they were practicing increased by 21%. Wow. Nearly the same. Because again, the mind can't tell the difference between a real or an imagined experience. Which is why Paul talks about setting your mind on heavenly things. Think about the things about how else can you, we've never been to heaven. Most people haven't been to heaven. We, we imagine what we see there. We imagine the throne. We imagine the smell of the incense. We imagine the scepter of rulership we're holding, that crown on our head. Look down and we imagine that white flowing robe. You know, you, you feel alone. You imagine those four living ones around you. You can feel the Lord as you're sitting on the same throne with him. Maybe you feel him move over, give you more room, you know. You, you, can, you can see the lampstand. You can, so anything like that, I think that helps. How do you know he's taking the bag? Taking the bag? Yeah. Simply because he says he will. So faith. Peace. Yeah, faith. And peace. And peace, yeah, like Solomon says, peace, yeah. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Yeah, Philippians 6. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's really fun. It, it, that's not my subject tonight, but I, I think it's a good, important, important point. Um, if you read the Old Covenant, David calls God his high tower. Is God a lookout place? Has he made a, bone, a, a stone? And he was imagining that. Um, Moses endured as seeing the unseen one. Well, how can you see someone that's invisible? He had to imagine what God was like. Uh, yeah, David called him a small, a strong time, called him a rock. He'd been out, you know, with the sheep, and he knew what a, a, a cliff was. Be under that cliff, nobody can get you. So I think those, those things are really natural. The shepherd's song caused me to lay down in green pastures, uh, leads me beside still waters. Would you rather have still waters or be in the boat tossed like the disciples? That's kind of the neat thing. We can choose which one we want to think about, which one we want to see. And it'll have an effect. There's nothing magical about it. It's just the way we're wired. And uh, I think it's kind, of, it's kind of good to be reminded of that once in a while. It wasn't my message. But, uh, anything else? Yeah. What you're saying is a little bit like what the um, confession people talk about. Yeah. Except it's in your head. Yeah. 
in your head, you're imagining that what God says is true. Yeah. And, um, you know, then, you know, you can say it, but, yeah. you know, you can also imagine. Yeah. He says, throw all your cares right. on him. You can imagine yourself doing that yeah. because you believe it. It's yeah. like faith. Yeah. Right. And uh, one thing I'm learning more and more lately is the power also of affirming what God says. Um, there's, there's a truth there. It's been abused, but there is a truth there. There's something about hearing yourself say something positive rather than negative. It will change the way you feel listening to yourself say, God formed my spirit within me. What does that do to somebody from a bad family? Abusive mom, abusive dad, abusive siblings. God formed my spirit in me. I'm not related spiritually to this family. God did this. I'm the son. I'm a son of God. He's the father of spirits. Whatever it is that affects you, find scriptures that talk about that. And yeah, affirm them like Lars. Affirm them. And I suggest you can also think about, imagine what that's saying, what it means. It's, a, it's a healthy. Rather than the, the other things. Will, will affect you the bad way. So I think he gave us our imagination for a reason. Well, Isaiah says, Thou will keep him in per in, it's actually peace twice. You will you will keep him in peace, peace. Most translations say whose mind is stayed upon you. It's actually imagination. Whose imagination is stayed on you. He's my you're my rock, you're my high place, you're my high tower. You're a wall of fire around the mountain. The glory of God in the midst of me. When's the last time you walked down the street downtown imagining you were covered in fire? Well, why would you do that? Because you are. He'll cover me with his wings. That's exactly what happened to Jesus when he received the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit came down and his wings covered him. It's the same with us. It's, it's happening whether we believe it or not. I'm simply saying sometimes... Seeing it by the eye of faith is the connector. So it's a kind of you can experiment with it. Let me know how it goes. If it doesn't work, complain to Barbara or Solomon. We're going to come around the Lord's table. If you have gifts today, that's great. Baskets here, one in the foyer. Somebody gave my like PayPal today. Almost, almost half of our lease. It's, it's unreal what people are doing for the kingdom of God. Somehow nothing is keeping the course of